I will never get used to not having to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I am really grateful to be here and to talk to these amazing artists. Um, I just feel my soul is being quenched as well. I feel it just feels like such a selfish thing to be able to do. I feel like I, I needed this as much as um, uh, anybody else who's witnessing this. I just personally, intimately needed this. Um, just like bubbly. I'm already a bubbly person, but I'm just like, I'm a sh champagne right now. Um, I wanted to start this off. This is um, Juneteenth and um, part of um, ship. So I really wanted to, for the um, camera and Danielle to really speak towards like the the, um, the ancestors they wanted to uplift, both if they're in their bloodline or ancestors that, you know, who, who are, uh, who are just cosmically connected, however it is. I wanted to begin it with um, honoring those ancestors. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear the answers if you want to speak the name of before and, and let them enter it too, even though they may not show in the numerics of the participants. Danielle, do you have a preference? Oh, no, you go. Okay, I can go first. I'm going to share a little story just because I feel like that encapsulates my current relationship with my ancestors and the work that I'm doing with them. About a year and a half ago, I did an Akashic Record uh, experience with a friend. And one of the most visceral vision, visions I, I had was um, there were a group of my ancestors and they were all sort of like standing on each other's, each other's shoulders. And they were like hot and sweaty and tired and, and just so like, looked like they had been working for centuries. Um, and as I'm scanning through this like long line of ancestors, you know, there's one on top of each other's shoulders and it, it keeps going. And then at the very pinnacle, there's me. And then there's all of these folks just sort of like holding me up at the pinnacle being like, we did this work for you now go forth. <laughs> um, and after that vision, it sort of settled and I like opened my eyes and I, I felt the energy of all those people just standing in my room, just sort of praising me, praising each other, being like, we did that, we've arrived. And those are the ancestors that I want to honor today. I love that way. And even like the parallel between that image that you're telling me in the middle passage, like that, like the, the, the a pyramid, like the whole, the whole download was strong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to start by uh, honoring the ancestors of the Caribbean. So the Carib people, um, those that shared, uh, they all shared a, a single soul. So they shared the so same soul as the land. Um, and they uplifted anyone in the community who was um, giving back to the community and um, who they saw as like a valuable resource. Um, I'd like to uplift um, Mary Jones, who was a black trans woman in 1836, who the only uh, living record we have of her is a poster warning people away from her. Um, I'd like to uplift the ancestors on my grandma's side, who we have um, no trace back to um, and who I can never know and don't know anything about um, and uplift my grandma because she is a living ancestor right now. Um, spoke to her at a wedding <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and she has so much to say that no one's asked her um, and so she's not very forthcoming with information um, which is really interesting to me. Um, so it's, it's like a process of trying to tease out to learn more about um, my kind and my people. But at the same time, um, she recognizes the erasure that happens when she does speak. And so um, getting that information from her and with her um, is a process that I just want to uplift and say that um, is great. Beautiful. I would like to honor my great grandma, Rosalie, and my grandma, Rose. Um, and my uncle Stan, and uncle Troy, they they passed away um, within the year. My, um, uh, and I want to honor that. I also want to honor um, uh, just giving so much thanks to those ancestors and, the, and things that like the connection feels stronger. Things that like I got connected 
just in the nick of time. So, you know, I bypass a certain type of loneliness or despair. Um, and then also the um, the ancestors like Sun Ra and Alice Coltrane that have felt, I, I was like reading, so I just got Sun Ra's children's book today. And I was like, of course I would get Sun Ra's children's book the day of this, like, of course. Um, but just honoring those ancestors that um, keep, keep me funky, keep it, keep it interesting and um, have a, have a um, lineage for that. Um, so speaking of, you know, like any important thing that I do is informed by astrology and I'm really big into escape. And I think one of the things that really attracts me about both of you all's work is that you take escape to me very seriously. It's not actually escapism as like running away from something, but an escape as an imagining an alternative reality. Um, could you just, just bounce on like what escape means to in your work and am I just making this up or is it actually something significant that you're holding in your work? Um, uh, sorry, camera, I'm just going to jump in here. Um, so yeah, so for me, I don't often think of escape, really. I think of like making something that should have been here years ago. Um, and often when I think of what me and camera are actually doing, it's often that something that should have been here um, and probably was at one point in time, but we don't have any proof of it ever existing. And so for me, um, the beginning of any process is um, how do I make sure this lasts and how do I make sure it speaks to those that I care about? Um, and so escape, it never really is a, a thing that I've really thought about because I'm tired of escaping. I'm tired of having to escape. I'm tired of that being a thing that um, people say that we need. Actually, we don't need something that is, that's an escape from. We need to no longer have to escape and sit in spaces that can hold us easily. Um, so that's kind of why I'm so into building and designing and crafting worlds that center black trans people is that we finally need spaces where we can sit and that's all. And we don't have to bring in anything there. Um, and I don't really think it starts and stops with the work because I'm hoping that someone sees my work and says I can do better than that and does their own. And so it builds into something that's much larger than just um, one person doing something. Yeah. Um, so that answer is so, I don't even, I, A, I'm, I'm just going to stand everything that everybody says. So, <laughs> um, but also, um, where, where, where does that, where does that come from, right? So I'm from Georgia, my, uh, uh, always been black and queer and gender non-conforming. My mom was a black lesbian, poor, growing up. Where, uh, and, and sometimes people ask me where the audacity comes from and, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and, I, and I'll, I'll rap about where I think it comes from. But then I'm like, where does this audacity come from to like, to, to have such a clear um, seeing into, it, it, to see beyond the certain things. And like, where, where does that come from? What do you, what, what do you afford that to? I think it comes from God. Okay, I coined this thing called the sisterhood stew, um, and essentially, it's a it's a how I think about like sisterhood between like black trans women is that like um, there's a stew and everyone is always putting something in it and giving to those who need some of the stew at the at the moment in time. Um, and to me, my black trans sisters are the reason I'm here, are the reason I'm existing, are the reason that I'm, I'm speaking to you today, that I have the confidence to even say the words black trans um, with me, because they're the ones that told me and saw me before I even saw myself. And so um, they crafted a, a space in which allowed me to not only like experiment and finding who I was, but actually to shout proudly at the top of my lungs, this is who I am, and to find it difficult going through that process, but at the same time, knowing that no matter what I said and did, um, it was fine because that space had been crafted for me. Um, and I was lucky enough to live with them. We all decided to live together. So we lived in the black trans house. And from that point on, I was like, this is the space I need. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more, there's nothing less. This is literally it. It doesn't have to have bells and whistles, doesn't have to have big TVs, money is nothing. It just has to be centering black trans people for black trans people and having them in the space. And so that's when my audacity came of just like, that's what I want. I don't care um, if anyone thinks the work is good. I don't care if, if you like it. I don't care if it doesn't fit into this conglomerate way of like looking at blackness and transness. It's for black trans people because those are the people that keep me alive and those are the ones that I want to keep alive. 
Mm. I feel like Danielle's answer to the first question really resonated with me. And what I want to add on to that is imagination is actually work, like having to imagine new worlds and build and grow and maintain systems. Like, I think imagination gets romanticized in a way that um, dilutes how uh, laborious it can be to have to build things from the ground up. And like Danielle mentioned, not have any archive of how it's been done before. Um, and then in terms of audacity, I mean, I've witnessed throughout my entire life, white people have so much audacity for absolutely no reason. So it feels good to be able to have audacity about something that actually matters. I love the, that absolutely matters part um, is just heavy for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I always think you're so, um, as I was just standing in, in this, this, in this researching you, there's such a, um, in order to be as witty and, and have such a, such a way with language as you do, it's just like, there's just a lot of brilliance going on that you almost sound bored with the world you've been offered that I really appreciate and resonate with. It's like, it's the it's the queer Daria moment that I kind of needed. Like the, sometimes when I read like um, the things that you'll end up producing, it's really, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in stand. So um, my next question is for you. Um, I grew up in the, in the South and it was a personal hell because I do not, I do not um, naturally like nature. <laughs> um, nature is something every single day that I'm learning to, and I'm talking about the trees and the bugs and the in the air and the sun, and you know these movements of like black people saying like you know sun like helps your melanin and all this other stuff. I'm like, well, there must there has to be another way because I don't want. <laughs> 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 what are my options? Right. <laughs> um, like, come on. Um, but I was really moved because I resonated with you so much just as a spirit and then seeing that you work with nature. And um, I wanted to ask, like, how, did, how does nature inform your work? I kind of know um, elementary how it informs your work, just like mm -hmm. the things I've seen using nature. But I would just like for you to kind of rap about like how, um, what make nature means to you. So hopefully mm -hmm. I can um, make this beat strip that people are telling me that they need me to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Minneapolis in Brooklyn Park. And it was when Brooklyn Park was like first being established. So a lot of the like natural growth and forest was still in the neighborhood. Um, and I remember like as early as four and five, just going out, right? Cause we lived in a, in a white neighborhood. So my mom would just let me go to the park by myself and do what I needed to do. And I would see the tadpole swimming around. I, ha I had a literal frog farm in my garage cause I was out here. Frogs were my dudes. Like I just, I loved being outside. There was a sunflower, um, there was sunflower acreage right in my backyard and I just, remember like frolicking and flailing and we had a jungle gym. And so um, even like the smell of grass and like the smell of pavement when it has just rained or when rain is coming, like it just is so uh, bodily awakening that it, it feel, I'm also an earth sign. So I'm just like in, I'm in it. Um, but I think my most recent approach to nature um, in regards to activation residency is just the like beauty of natural and organic systems. Like the earth has an entire system of ecology of the ways in which things work together. Like this one plant will be really good for like this species over here and they'll be doing their own thing. And I think what I'm really interested in is like, taking the, those systems and like replicating them in worlds like beyond nature. Um, I took a permaculture class this past winter and it was so, um, I guess the word I wanna use right now is affirming in the ways of which how ease, easeful things can be and like how easeful our relationship with nature can be like, land work and farming is not easy work, but it is necessary work. And so I think that um, I'm interested in finding ways to connect the worlds of like the means of production, like producing our own food, producing what sustains us and also like 
how that like sort of like feeds our like creative juice and the way that we like interact with each other in this sort of like ephemeral creation world. Um, I would love for my dream is to have an artist residency where like an artist can step outside of their studio and like pick raspberries from the bush right outside, you know, or like head, you know, further west and like do some composting on their break. I think like having a direct relationship with nature um, is decolonial in the way that it gives us access to not have to rely on systems that seek to destroy us. And so, um, yeah, as a political agenda and also like a life goal, I want to be in direct relationship with the land. And a lot of that has to do with like, you know, healing that work, like figuring out like, why do we get uncomfortable about, about these mosquitoes? Like, how can we work with them, you know? Um, how can we embrace the salt from our sweat as the sun is hitting us? Um, there's so many things to think about. I really appreciate that question. I, I appreciate you for doing the real work because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a lot of, one of the things that I am is honest and that has always been a struggle for me because I intellectually know you right but like I'm not gonna lie about where I'm at with my being because that just creates a whole bunch of bullshit <laughs> like, so I, I intellectually know where I'm at um but I, I found that really um in, inspiring specifically because I related with you just on like a visceral level in your work and everything you were doing and I'm like oh this person's doing this so it kind of reminded me of like you know, when you when you see, you know, Jimi Hendrix or George Clinton or Khalees for the first time, you're like, oh, this person likes this. Like, maybe I'm maybe maybe I should adopt everything else that they're doing, or maybe they they can expand me on other things. So I love um how you meditate on that. There was there was something that I wanted to um go back to you on around um uh ancestors. And and uh, this could be a question for both of you all if 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 um if it resonates, but one of the things is I, I was pretty self-taught. Um, I kind of grew up in, in, a, um, in, a, in a school of spirituality. And I'm really, I'm really fascinated with you all, how it seems intellectual groups, political groups, um, and spiritual groups all take you seriously. But I've noticed because spiritual work is usually seen as like a um, Black work, a, 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 a femme work and stuff like that, it's not necessarily taken seriously in social political circles or intellectual circles. Um, one of the people, despite what we think about this person, uh, you know, whatever, but I, I, I've i always admired Bell Hooks in Cornell West because they seem to have like a very spiritual center when they enter these intellectual debates. How do you all navigate having such a clear connection with spirituality but then being able to take yourself seriously as an intellectual or is that just a part of just be transcending the <laughs> the moment how, how you all seem to do yeah um i think my like introduction and connection with spirituality has been a bit of a, a weird one to be honest um like i grew up in a very christian household i went to a variety of different churches um um like different from like my grandma's church which was very like happy clappy church and then to like a very very uh, english ch church which the person would do the same sermon every single week um to essentially i guess when i think about spirituality i don't think about like like deities i don't think about gods i think about uh, people in the past have done the work to let us think like we do now um and a lot of the time i think about like the first person who thought of transitioning in in the terms that we understand it today and the first person that did a mental transition and then the first person to say it out loud and then the first person to try it and then the first person to accept it and then the first person to extend it and then the first community to accept it the first person to write it down um and that is kind of my my reach into spirituality in the fact that i i believe that there is a foundation out there for our existence that once existed so concretely um, that we can kind of reach back into that through through trying to think through really thinking about what it's like to center ourselves through really thinking about what it means to have a space of blackness away from the terms we even use to describe ourselves um, away from the language of of 
identity politics, essentially, away from all that language that has been made up for us to function in the current world um, to get back there. So that's kind of how I navigate spirituality. And I used to, I made this work about the feeling of being watched and having shadows in my room and knowing these shadows um, weren't there to wish me malice or anything, but were just to make sure they held my head above water so I didn't drown. Um, and that's the kind of spiritual kind of rhetoric I feel within my body is that um, I, I don't know how to name it. I don't really know how to talk about it very well, but I know, um, but because in my heart, I know that someone like me has never been new. Um, I can I can very easily feel that sense of being watched by something um, with a longer history than I do. And that's kind of how I relate to spirituality or see it for myself. Um, so I grew up Muslim and I do resonate with a lot of Islamic tenets, but I feel like in my current life, my spirituality is wrapped up in the kind of person I want to be in the world, um, abundance and relationship. And um, I say the kind of person I want to be in the world because I feel like my transness has given me the opportunity to reflect on personhood and beingness beyond just a gender presentation. And then abundance, because I started doing abundance magic last year, and it's just been so resonant in terms of how easy it is to, how easy it can be to multiply things, um, not just money, but resources and energies and um, like, like multiply in an expanse way. And then relationship, because I feel like some of the most profound learning and shifts that I've gone through in my life have been through relationship um, and the people that I love and being able to hold myself accountable to the person I wanna be by um, having a collaborative approach to relationship building, um, checking in with people in the ways that I wanna be checked in with. Um, and so I don't really think that there is um, too much separation between the intellectual experience that I'm having in the world and the spiritual experience that I'm having in the world. And I think one of the most beautiful aspects of world building for me is to be able to insert that into my work. Um, so being able to talk about abundance, like I just did a job description for a grant writer and I was like, you have to have an abundant perspective <laughs> and that I can do that. Like I have the freedom to do that, so. Fire, love it. Um, I'm trying to like sneak in like all my questions. I feel like such a good, like just like a fan. I feel like I'm just juicing it all up. Um, I did want to ask, oh, which one should I do first? I'm just like, I'm like, now I'm like panicking. Okay, what, what roles I do, um, what roles do collaboration play in both of you all's practice? What, um, and, and what's your views on collaboration? Um, specifically after, you know, I, uh, I think I've just seen what collaboration means to me more expansively. Um, so I'm really curious at what, um, how collaboration plays in your practice and your day-to-day -day life and your art forms and what inspires you. Sorry, I'm in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can share first. Um, so I have a pretty um, vast understanding of the ways in which I can support other people. So the way that I like to collaborate is coming forth to the table with like my skills and talents and what I can offer. And then using that as a body for other people to be able to do what they need to do. So for example, I'm really great at organizing. I'm really great at creating structure. I'm really good at like laying the groundwork. Um, and I did that with Activation Cooperative Fund, which is an online platform where, that folks can join as a member um, and propose that funds be spent on specific things. Um, so for example, somebody joins the Cooperative Fund, they pay like a membership fee of $5 a month. 
And then if they want to propose that like $1,000 be spent on their rent, they can do that. And then that money gets released to them um, unrestricted within 72 hours. So for me, I was like, okay, I can like build this platform so that other folks can come in and do what they need to do. Um, I think that the work of the artist is very comprehensive in, in terms of the business aspect, like having to manage the work, having to book the work, having to do concept, having to creatively direct. And so if an artist can have an opportunity to have all of the logistical stuff taken care of to just show up and do their art, that's a beautiful thing. And so I like to provide services so that other folks can have access to what they need to do. And I think um, that way of collaborating has allowed me to get really clear on what my skills are, as well as allow other people to do what they do without having to experience all of those extra layers of, um, um, of work. And are you just good at that because you're a Virgo or was there, <laughs> <laughs> is this just, just a heavenly gift or like, it was there, is there, <laughs> um, mm. I think it's just like a life process thing. Um, it it feels like work that I've been doing my whole life. And so it just feels natural and intuitive. Well, yeah, it's the workout. <laughs> <laughs> I will say like, I want to name that Danielle and I are both Virgos and we are both out here building worlds, so. And, and then now also, um, <laughs> and I'm a Pisces. So we're like actually like, supposed to be the opposites. So this is an interesting moment. I feel like I'm like leaning. I think that's why I'm so excited about this talk. Um, Danielle, how about you? How does um, collaboration inform um, what you do, your process, any part of your process? I mean, collaboration is is everything. It's everything. There's no point in making any of my work if there's no collaboration in it. Um, usually how I work is that I have like an idea for something um, that I want to exist for us. And then I build a team of Black trans people to do it um, and we all get paid and we all um, take the credit that we want to take. Um, something that I do within the process is that um, people credit themselves how they want. So if they want to credit themselves as artistic designer, they do that. If they want to credit themselves as the head artist, they do that. I don't care about the credit. It's all about um, making sure that it feels like a team. Um, and when we built Black Trans Archive, um, I came in with the idea of wanting to do an archive, but all the choices, all the landscapes, um, all the designs of the characters were actually done collaboratively with everyone else. Um, and they told me what they did like and what they didn't like and what kind of direction um, would even should even be present there as well as what choices should we have. Um, the reason I actually started getting into games was because um, when I was working with a bunch of black trans people, we were thinking about putting something online um, and then the discussion got into, okay, how do we center ourselves if not everyone online is black and trans? Um, and so even, even my path into video games is coming from um, collaboration and talking to the community um, that, I, that I have. Um, because I really believe in, if you don't have the foundations of your um, practice as black and trans with other black trans people, then there's no point in making the end piece. Because if you didn't have it at the beginning of the conversation, the, la the thing you do, if, even if it says black trans people are the best, the process is not there to hold them up. So the only person you're uplifting is yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not uplifting others while you go along with it, if others can't feel themselves resonate within the work, then you're not doing the, the work, you know, which is something that I love about cameras practice is that it's based around making sure others can center themselves. And that's like the, the practices I love are the ones that center other people. It may be one person's thing, but it can make sure that others can feel centered at any moment in time. Yes, that's, wait, let me, uh, TJ, where am I at? What's, what's going on? The whole team is coming with us. <laughs> uh, yes yes like that's that's what, how i want to move i want to move with the whole team if someone books one of us we're all there yeah and i do this thing and it's a bit of a cheeky thing but um when i have meetings with like institutions i bring a black people to the meetings <laughs> just to make sure i have more black people than, than them 
<laughs> and I can't do it to every meeting because not everyone's free, but sometimes just bringing people to meetings so that they, they're with you, so people can see this is who they're working with. It's not just one person, it's a community to make sure that they feel outnumbered, to make sure that the centering is on you, to make sure they're not like trying to do some nonsense to you. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I really like love to do. Like I love to appear as a community rather than just as one person. Right, right, which is like, uh, so that, that's, I, I hate to like make it seem like that's how like people are God, but that's how, that's how people are God. <laughs> you know, you kind of come as this like one individual and then you're like, oh, like we, 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 we eat folks like you up for breakfast. But, but when you really come as a community and as somebody who doesn't, and, and when you really, speaking of that abundance that you were talking about, when that, that's coming out abundant, you're not coming out of scarcity. There's no, I need you in order to survive. It's like, no. I have options and you might be one of them and you're not just going to like cannibalize me and my work in order for me to make have a check or get some more notoriety or to like expand a platform and i think that um sat like sadly but uh, all, but i think sadly that's what has happened in the past but then it's really great to see people just be illuminated and just say like you know what i call the shots in this i call the shots of like what's happening next and stuff and it's, and it's inspiring um, hold on, cause I don't want to, I want to make sure, okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not the one being selfish as we like in the hour. <laughs> um, what's interesting about uh, your work, Danielle, but this is a question for both of y'all, but uh, Danielle's work like kind of like brought me here. Um, what's interesting about your work is that the choices that you, you people make, I'm, I'm really big on being present, right? There's this, like this, this text from the Holy, from a Holy book that I read that says, um, when you're in the present moment, you um, heal the past and you program the best possible future. And um, I think that when you're really, right? <laughs> so, I think, <laughs> but I think, but I think um, when you're really present with choices that you're making, that's a weird, that's a good way to like pull you towards the present. So um, that is just my big Piscean way of asking: What are the practices that you're using that that to make you make you all present and be present in the moment? Because I think that's what's interesting about both of you all's work is that's why I feel so um, why it makes me feel so immersive, why it feels so um, just just dripping with y'all's essence is because y'all are present and y'all and y'all know yourselves. And I just want to know um, what are the practices that you all are doing um, to, to, to keep you present in the present moment? That's a good ass question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really great question. I don't know if I have a good answer for it, but um, Something that keeps me, I don't even know if I've got an answer for that, to be honest. I don't know if like how well I keep myself present within my daily life. Like I, some, so something I can, which is weird, I can do in my work is I can be as free as I want to be in my work. Yeah. I can really, if like, if I'm working with a group of people and one of them is un 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 unhappy, I can cause the biggest scene that I can and I don't have any anxiety over that or anything because like that feels right. Right. Um, and I think it's like when, when I, when we manage to build these spaces um, in that moment, I feel like there's this thing called black trans power. And recently, yesterday, actually, I was writing about black trans power and when we feel it. And if I say it out loud, do I feel powerful or do I feel worried about saying those words? Um, and did if I tell someone to shout out black trans power, do they feel anxious um, or does someone say it with them? Um, and so for me, the moments of presentness or when I'm feeling aware is like when the words that are coming out of my mouth, the words that I'm hearing from others, the looks I'm even getting make us all feel powerful and see the power within ourselves. Like I have this phrase that there is power in not passing, but the, the but getting and finding that, that stage and being able to stand in the mirror and saying, I don't pass and that's powerful um, is something that I feel gets to this moment of presentness, gets to this moment of like, living in this present and accepting it because I feel like often because we're trans so much is of the conversation around our bodies not from us um, is about moving through stages forgetting the past and finding the end and being present in transness and saying how I look now is good 
and is amazing and should be loved by me first of all and others um, and is not a transitionary period this is a period of my life is the thing that I feel like I find most presence or, or presentness in well, that was a great answer. <laughs> I found it. I had to look for it, though. I was present in front of it. Okay, so I, I love this question because presence is very high of a priority for me, and I'm glad that that has resonated in my work for you. Um, I think the first thing that came up for me was consent. I started taking consent and boundary classes last year during the pandemic and what it illuminated for me was that consent has the ability to operate as this entire like foundational way of being in relationship with other people that just like it's like a force it like brings you in it makes you check in ask questions be curious like say what you need like say no and it's just like it's such it's such a tool like it's a fundamental tool for me um and then the other thing is my music practice i'm a musician um i'm putting out my first ep this year and the process of music making and being present like with your voice is is so uh it just requires you to show up like I have to be in my body um, and I, that that's another thing too. like on, on a more macro level is I feel like the work that Danielle and I do requires us to be in our bodies like you can't be in a dissociated space, you know, creating magic it's like I think. I think when we get into disassociation that's when harm happens and when, when we get into presence like that's when like ease and flow and generosity happen um so yeah i like oops sorry <laughs> that sounds like a landline hold on talk about abundance a landline that's that's an abundant um artifact <laughs> um I, I know we have a hard five right shamika somebody um, we have about two minutes left, so I thought it'd be great for camera to wrap up on their thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Um, and before we end. Of music, my producer just got to my place, so. Beautiful, the beautiful. Um, and I love that because I've been working on music as well. And that's been like the mixing and mastering of it, the really having to like curate my own space. And like you're saying, like, I'm not a natural singer, despite being big and black, I just don't have a natural gospel voice. So it's like, it's like, in order for my voice to sound how I need for it to sound, I can't just, um, I can't dissociate. Um, I can't quite articulate how much this talk has meant to me. Um, it's just been inspiring. Again, I think that everything in the universe happens for a reason. So um, for intimate spiritual reasons, I think I needed to like ask these questions and hopefully be a channel and a vessel for other people who look up to you all um, and ask the questions that help them be the artists that you want. Because I think I was researching you all and I get the questions that you're usually asked, but I think there's so many people who want to be you, y'all when they grow up. And there's this like, certain fundamental questions that people need to know what's happening in the mind and the spirit. And in order to arrive at the kind of artists you all, all are and it can't just all be in the intellectual and the physical so thank you for letting Ooh. me know that channel. you come on ain't that the <laughs> word ain't that the word so, um before let me be that channel and um for taking let me take up your a little bit of your time thank you so much miles camera and danielle that was amazing and miles just to kind of you know tinker off your note i have a mentor and she'd always say academia is deadlier than the streets because there's so much separation there right. so thank you for channeling in honing in on the spirit uh, and thank you all for joining with us if you'd like to learn more about danielle about camera about miles their instagram is in the bio as long as they're as well as their cash app and their venmos so if you want to support their work go ahead and do that show that love um so thank you thank you for being here bye. love you all thank you so much bye bye thank you so much take care thank you thank you